Uh, thanks so much, Laura. This is the uh, part of the program you guys are all familiar with where the speaker says, I understand that you know we are the last thing standing in the way between you and the, um, and the drinks, and so we're going to try to be brief and all that, and that usually turns out to be a lie. But um, we'll do our best. I think we're, we're right on time, and so I think we, we'll be able to stick to that schedule. Um, I will say just a, a, a couple things about Illinois Ventures. One of the things that makes us, um, I think, pretty unique is that we're actually part of the university. We're part of a, the university system office, so that includes UIC in Chicago, as well as University of Illinois at Springfield, and, of course, um, Champaign-Urbana. And uh, so our mission is to commercialize stuff that's coming right off the campus. That's, that's our whole job. That's faculty entrepreneurs, that's licensed technologies, that's student ventures. Um, and then we also have a, a, a separate fund. We've had actually raised a series of funds over the years um, that uh, invest in alumni ventures and things like that. So if there's a university connection, um, we try to uh, see what we can do to be part of that financing strategy. Um, we can't do it all our own, but uh, we try to bring what resources we can to bear to help uh, people get that first round of financing put together. Um, and with that, I want to uh, just say a couple words. Um, I, I, was, I was talking with Aaron about how I was going to introduce him, and you looked like you might be a little bit embarrassed. So I'm not going to go through his whole bio. It's in your book. Um, but I do want to say that um, one of the things I think is fascinating about his resume is that he's been a venture capitalist, he's been a, an operator, he's been a fund of funds manager, uh, and if you don't know what that is, that matters in our business, and um, he's even been a government policy maker. I think that's a, that gives you a pretty um, sort of a unique way to look at the whole ecosystem uh, that uh, we're, the investors are really just a piece of uh, when it comes to trying to bring new technologies and new innovations to, to the market. He's also been a great friend to Illinois Ventures. It was Aaron that actually originally introduced us to Mike Liang, who was on our board for many years. Uh, and uh, so we are, I'm just really honored to have a chance to sit here with um, Aaron and give him a chance to talk about S2G, S2G Ventures and what he's up to. And I'm just going to start with a question right away. Uh, yes. Or we could do the... This one? No. Thank so you, the, So the first question is that, uh, hey, S2G Ventures is, looks like uh, you're all about food and agriculture and ag technology. And, um, and what is it about this ag tech food? Um, um, what made you decide that that is the right sector to be going into at this time? Well, first, Tom, thank you for the introduction, and it's good to be here. Um, I am an alumni of University of Illinois, and so just being in person, given what we've all kind of gone through for the last two years, is actually, um, it's, it's a little surreal, actually, to be honest with you, but it's good to see everyone. So S2G, maybe a little bit of background on the firm. We were founded about nine years ago, uh, focused on food and ag, um, so the entire supply chain. So t still today... We invest in everything from ag inputs, um, actually farmland, ag inputs, processors, ingredient companies, brands, as well as fast casual uh, restaurants. And our view is that system or value chain kind of perspective gives us unique insights. It allows us to understand what consumers think and how that applies upstream as well as what farmers and producers are dealing with their challenges and how that can be um, maybe employed downstream from, from them. And then we can look at innovation and try to invest behind that because ultimately we'll have a better sense of, we hope, of what maybe the channel needs or, or their constraints are um, as well as what they're willing to pay for. Um, because I think as, as Dennis noted and others have said, you know, ag is um, a large, and food are, are large TAMs, large markets, but um, difficult in terms of making uh, venture type returns. And um, S2G was founded about nine years ago by Lucas Walton and two of my partners. Lucas is a third generation uh, member of the Walton family, only child. Sam was his grandfather. And Lucas had had a very strong affinity for, um, for food and, and agriculture given the Walmart history. The Walton family is still very involved in Walmart and are, are the big owners. 
um, not involved in the operations, but but big long-term patient owners. And as Lucas looked at what was going on in food and agriculture, he realized that there were really two food systems. There's sort of the food systems for the worried well, um, and there is a food system that is sort of everyone else. And what he was looking at is how can you use innovation, entrepreneurship to um, drive down the cost of innovation of, of healthy food, um, sustainable food. And so um, lucky for me, he chose venture capital as the way to do that. And so we set up a fund in 2013, 14, um, a first fund of 120 million. We then raised, we still have only have one investor, Lucas is our only investor, um, but we're set up as a typical fund. Uh, we set up a second fund in 2017, 18 of 280 million, and then most recently closed a $550 million fund. And um, continue to do the same strategy of early and growth stage investing, checks as small as 500,000 and as large as 30 to 40 million as we help a company scale. Um, I just spent some time looking at your portfolio on your website, and you and I talked a little bit about your sort of strategy and what you, you used the word themes. Uh, you said you like to follow three basic themes in your, when you're investing in this space. One of them was um, biologics, another was digital agriculture, and, and the third was food traceability. I wonder if you would speak a little bit about why you chose those three and maybe you can give us an example of a portfolio company in each of these that will give the audience a sense of um, you know, what really sets an opportunity apart so much that you really want to um, roll up your sleeves and get involved with it. Sure, so we tend to, there's so many opportunities in this space these days and I think on the upstream ag side, we, it, across the supply chain, we tend to think of things as themes or clusters of, of opportunities, they tend to have similar dynamics of you know, how they're working with the channel, how they're thinking about a margin, how um, they uh, you know, think about pricing, et cetera. And so when three of those themes are digital ag, biologics, and um, traceability, I'll maybe start with traceability because I think that is the biggest challenge for us in a sense. We see, as Dennis I think even noted, um, you know, we see a demand from consumers where they, are, they want to understand where their products are coming from. This is, again, I'm specifically talking about food traceability uh, here. Um, this and, is also and, and true And I assume for, we're mostly talking about, to, to tie back your last, this is the worried well that's we're probably cool. talking uh, about. Today, although when you, when you ask consumers today, particularly younger consumers, 75% um, of all consumers say they want to understand what, where their food has come from in the supply chain. Um, consumers are reading ingredient labels a lot more than they were before. Um, many products now have, uh, you know, scanners where you can look at who is the producer on your product. You can find that on your General Mills product, on Cheerios, um, on your mac and cheese from right. Annie's, things like that. And so it's starting there, but they are starting to essentially commoditize that and drive that cost down. The challenge in traceability is cost. Who's going to pay for that? Um, you know, it's a lot of work for the producer if they need to track these products for the supply chain that don't have a lot of margin. And if General Mills, Kraft, Kellogg, or the consumer is not willing to pay for it, ultimately those products fail. Right. But I will say today, given all the supply chain risks, logistics challenges, there continues to be, I think, a demand for understanding where your products are in the supply chain. And we put that in the category of sort of traceability. There's also aspects of the Paris Agreement that we're hearing from the Nestle's of the world and others that I've mentioned, where they're saying we've signed up for certain carbon commitments because of, or climate commitments because of Paris, and to execute on those and um, show Wall Street that we have, have done what we said we were gonna do, the biggest challenge is scope three emissions. And right now, they don't understand or don't have visibility through the supply chain to be able to track that and that, that sort of ties into the digital ag side. It's sort of in both traceability and digital ag. One company on the traceability side that I, um, I really like in our portfolio is a company called Safe Traces. And they essentially have an edible DNA tag that you know, costs pennies or fractions of a penny that you can put on a product and it will uh, be traceable throughout the supply chain. It doesn't degrade through heat or or any sort of um, any sort of pressure on the on the product. What I like about that company is they have 
been working on that technology. They've had a number of pilots, but had some challenges when COVID struck because innovation basically got shut down by a lot of these big companies. And so what they did is they took that same technology and they realized that actually they could use that functionality in um, building systems, HVAC systems, to track the flow of air, to check for particulates in the air, um, to uh, actually working with another university, they found that they could track for COVID in the air as well. And their largest customer was Google that signed up for them. And they've now started to scale that product. Not as much food anymore in ag, um, which is a little bit of a disappointment to us. But I liked how an uh, entrepreneur was faced with a crisis and thought, I've got a platform here. How do I use this in a different way? Who do I know in my network that I can try this and, and go from there? On the digital ag side, um, you know, we've heard a number of companies and, and talked about this increase in data that's happening in, in agriculture. You know, we talk about sort of data poor to data rich, if not data saturated now. I think the challenge is there is not, at least as we've seen, um, sort of a, um, a single solution or a set of platform solutions for entrepreneurs today, or for producers, I should say, farmers today. They are, deer gets close to that, but all of these digital tools that are being developed, um, that are being started by entrepreneurs, many of them are point solutions. And if you're a producer, you know, you can't have a contract here and another contract here and another, and then you've got to think about how do I integrate this and, and then does it help me make real time decisions um, for, uh, in my field? Does it also, does the pricing model work? Many, many companies that we talk to have pricing models that just don't scale. Maybe they're fine for a 100 acre farm, but they're not, or 160, but they're not fine for 3,000 acres um, because that same producer you know, doesn't want to spend five or 10 or 20 bucks an acre. Um, it gets very expensive. And so that's an area that we like a lot, but we think that there's real opportunity for potential consolidation there. We think that there is a chance for um, real scale to build a company with 25, 50, 100 million of ARR that um, you know, Microsoft or Google or some of the big uh, tech companies will want to get into this space. Today, they're sort of, in many ways, they want you to buy their cloud services um, and, and they like the data, but they're not necessarily willing to commit um, from an, an M&A perspective um, or even for a company to go IPO. One company that I like in that space is a company called Earth Optics. Uh, they are um, out of the East Coast and have a sensor that they've put on um, existing deer and CNH equipment that is uh, fairly cheap and it, it provides for um, helping a farmer understand compaction and moisture in their soil. Okay. Um, and so that's a real, and it's fairly cheap. Um, on the biologic side, you know, that's an area that's growing quite a bit. Um, there's a, uh, you generally from a regulatory perspective have a much shorter time to market than you do um, if you're working with a chemical, uh, pesticide or fungicide, um, the EPA generally will give you about half the time uh, that you can come to market. Um, the challenge there is, you know, efficacy, um, consistency, uh, stability, these products uh, are, are challenging. And so there's a lot of in innovation happening there to try to ch solve those challenges. Um, and one company that I like there is a company called SoundAg. Uh, again, probably an interesting story where an entrepreneur had a bigger vision. They started with a product called Source that is mainly for corn and soy, and they are working on nitrogen and phosphorus, um, uh, essentially building that in the soil using microbes. And that is, in many ways, a loss leader for them. They're making money from it, but it's funding what is a bigger idea that they're working around on epigenetics and genetic uh, manipulation of, of seeds. Um, and so as an investor, they sort of sold us the bigger vision, but said, in the meantime, we're going to be working on this technology. We've got sales, we've got channel partners, and we're going to market with that, but we've also got a bigger vision here too, which is exciting, but it also sometimes can be challenging because, you know, we always talk about focus, focus, right, focus. Right. So there's trade-offs that you're making when you um, invest behind an entrepreneur like that. Uh, I've got just really kind of one more question that's really, really interesting to me. Um, as an early stage investor, and then we'll open it up to some questions from the audience. But you know, I, I find that uh, ag tech is a challenging area for um, early stage investing, um, especially when you're um, 
the companies are developing technologies and the market is growers or producers. Yeah. Uh, because if your product or your technology is going to involve some sort of pilot period before you can actually really scale it out to the world, you can only do that once a year because you're tied to growing seasons and it means that iterating in a company like that is a lot slower than it is for a lot of other technology companies in other sectors that you're also looking at as a venture capital. And so those, that's, your competi that's their competition for your money. So what advice do you have for an ag tech entrepreneur that's in that sort of a situation about um, how they should think about raising money, where they should raise money, what they can do to really um, position their company so that it's more scalable um, in the early going so that a firm like yours can see that you can get the return you need to get? I, uh, it, this is a hard one because I think the the promise of agriculture and, and just the whole food system, as I mentioned earlier, large addressable market, but yet for, and that has, you know, continues to grow, but has been that way for 50 years. Yeah. Yet the amount of venture money that's come into ag tech has been relatively small until most recently. And there's a reason for that, right? I mean, markets tend to be fairly efficient, I believe. And so the reason market, money was not flowing into that market is because investors didn't see the opportunity to make money there, despite the fact that it was a huge addressable market. Um, I think part of that is because the adoption cycles are really long. And so if you're an entrepreneur, I think recognizing that is important. You know, us as investors, uh, we have certain milestones we have to hit for our investors. Everyone's got sort of a boss, if you will, um, in the food chain. And so our investors are looking to us and saying, you know, typically to 10 year life can be extended. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a venture fund actually finish in 10 years. Typically they take 15 or, or longer years, but. It's good to know that we're not alone in that. Yeah. In fact, actually early on in my career, um, Bon French, who is sort of renowned in the investment business, founded a firm called Adam Street Partners, told me he had a 36 year old venture fund in his portfolio, um, which, I don't know, always, I always remember that, like it can't be that bad. Um, so, uh, but I think understanding, if you're an entrepreneur and you're engaging an investment firm, understanding where they are in their fund cycle, uh, where they, how many years they have left, uh, you know, talking with other entrepreneurs that are in their portfolio, I think is critical. Uh, you are in partnership with these investors. And so knowing what their reputation is like, what they do, how they handle themselves when things go wrong, because things are going to go wrong. You're going to lose customers. You're going to lose talent. You're going to, you know, deal with an outcome that you weren't expecting. And understanding how we react to that is important. Um, and, you know, hopefully you hear positive things, but sometimes, you know, things in the boardroom or in a discussion, there's, you know, strong debates and positions. And that's good. I mean, that's healthy. That's what you want. You want a partner that makes you better, um, that makes you sort of figure things out in the, in the trenches. And I think um, understanding that is important, but, but part of that could be other pressures that that investor is feeling. Whether it's, you know, if they're in year eight of their fund and they've got two years left, um, theoretically, you know, they may be saying like, let's sell the company. That may not be the best decision for the, for the company. And it may be, but I think that's something to understand. And understanding their motivations, what's driving their behavior is important. That doesn't mean that every investor is making decisions for the wrong motivations, but it's like everybody. We all have our own motivations for what we, what we decide to do. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it's sort of the cycle. It's can they write, is this a one-time check? Is it over several rounds of capital? There's nothing right or wrong about either of those models, but just understanding that. Because if they typically write a check each additional round, but in your company they don't, that's a bad signaling right. to the market. And so if they have done that in other companies, it may, may be fine, but I think if you see that, you, know, you should know and then ask the investor before they come into your company, help me understand why you didn't participate in that investment because it maybe sent a bad signal to the market. Those are things I think you've got to do diligence on the investment firm you partner with. I think that's really strong advice, and it actually brings me back to, I mean, Laura, you mentioned this a little bit earlier when you were talking about some of the um, 
nice things about the research park here, and one of those is that um, this ecosystem is so good at helping entrepreneurs get non-dilutive grant funding, whether it's SBIRs or STTRs or things like that. And you know, being able to tap into a, a pot of money at those, in, that, in those early years when you're doing that iterating and trying to make sure that you actually have a product market fit and not doing it while the clock is ticking with a venture capital investor, I think is, is, is really a benefit. So let's open it up. Um, I'm seeing we got five minutes left. So who has some questions for Aaron about um, um, early stage or even maybe not so early stage um, ag technology and food investing? Anybody? Dennis Beard has already answered all of your questions. Shy I was a little bit worried about that. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. I'm just going to um, ask one more, and that is, um, what would you? What is the the single best piece of advice that you can give to somebody about how they can go about um, impressing you or your colleagues at a firm like S2 S2G, and um, kind of get that fundraising conversation started on the right foot? What, 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 what wows you when somebody comes in to talk to you for the oh, first time? I, I, that's a tough one. I mean, I would, I think in many ways it's mindset. Um, you know, we're, we're obviously listening to the innovation. We're trying to understand the company. But, you know, ultimately we're going to be signing up for a seven to ten year partnership. And so we have a um, cultural pillar in our organization called Beginner's Mindset. It's not necessarily unique. But we ho try to hold ourselves accountable for always being in a room with smarter people than us because, and ask lots of questions. Ask questions first um, and just try to learn, constantly trying to learn. And I think if we can find entrepreneurs or if we're in a meeting with an entrepreneur and they come across as a know-it-all and they have all the answers and you know, you're asked, because I mean, many times the first meeting, you're really just trying to understand. And you know, a lot of times there's a lot of buzzwords and you're trying to cut through that and really and if that entrepreneur is pushing back and sort of just abrasive, you know, many times we'll get off the phone and be like, that's really interesting, but we, not for us. We don't want to be a partner with them. Um, and I think it's, it's a subtle thing, but it's just being, you know, um, I don't know, I say normal. But, you know, don't, just don't be arrogant. Be, you got to have an ego cause you, and be somewhat crazy because you're an entrepreneur. You're starting a company. Like, that is... All your friends are probably telling you this is a crazy idea. What are you doing? But I think it is that it's more of the mindset of wanting to learn, wanting to get better, wanting to improve, and then hire people around you as well. That's the other thing we look for is if you've hired people around you that are more talented than you or more connected or what, that's a good sign for us. Um, it reminds me of um, in my class, I always bring in early on in the class a, a gentleman Nathan named Nathan Gold as a speaker on pitching to investors early on in the class. And he says it's all about likability. And I think that's a great way to think about it. It's not likability like, oh, you're so nice and so kind. It's really, is this a entrepreneur uh, that I want to work with for the next five or 10 years? Because not only are we going to make a lot of money, but we're going to have fun while we're doing it. And even flinty-eyed venture capitalists like to, like to be able to enjoy their jobs. So um, I think that's, the, that's how I would follow up on what you were describing is uh, make sure that you're, um, you know, you have to be an expert. You have to, have to know your stuff, but you also have to be uh, able to communicate that you're somebody that your stakeholders are going to really, really, really enjoy working with. And I think that's, a, that's, um, that's, that's one way to set yourself apart from the competition. All right, I think that we are out of time. Is that right? Tom, I was going to go to Sophie on Teams. And oh, go ahead. Sorry. Hi, I'm Sophie. I'm a recruiter. And um, I'm wondering what you see as the VC role in helping your companies build their teams and if you've seen any common threads in successful talent hired. Um, so we've, uh, we've just actually in our team, not for recruiting, but we've hired a head of people to help our companies sort of figure this out. I think in many ways it's um, understanding your culture. You know, as an entrepreneur, we, we try to stress to them that they, you know, they are in charge of, particularly the CEO or the founder is in charge of that culture, and you've got to be thinking about it. It's one more thing to think about. 
you know, uh, in terms of you've got investors, customers, the product, we think culture is just as important because when you're recruiting, and today, it, I mean, you could tell me, it's a tight labor market. It is incredibly competitive out there for our companies trying to recruit talent. And we think if you have the right culture, these are, tend to be small circles of, of um, you know, relationships, and um, that stuff matters and can make a difference when you're on the edge. And so you've got to be, you know, you got to offer a competitive salary, obviously. You've got to offer equity uh, in the company, typically. But, um, you know, really having a strong culture, I think, is, can make a difference uh, today. And that's something, I, well, yeah, that would be what I would say. I don't what know if that are, answers What are you able question. to do as a, as a VC investor, as a board member, to really help your entrepreneurs recruit? Yeah, so we have, I mean, we do small things. Like we list, all of our companies have listings of jobs on our website. So we have, I think, um, I looked at it last week, it was like 460 jobs across their companies. We promote every week. One of us is assigned on our team to promote on LinkedIn, five or six of those jobs out to our network. Um, we um, typically, we're working on kind of C-level and board member hires. So we've got a couple of recruiters that we work with that have just been rock stars for us. Um, and they've, one in particular, has probably hired 17 of our C-level executives across our companies and um, probably eight board members uh, that we've used. And we've negotiated a, um, a rate so that our entrepreneurs don't have to go and try to you know, nickel and dime back and forth. They can just say, okay, I know I'm gonna get at least vetted service. And, um, and then they've got a couple of groups that we've vetted on that. Um, we can't do the work for, the, for them, but um, if we meet really interesting people, we try to refer them. Again, I will, it's a, maybe if we have a minute, I'll just tell an interesting Illinois story as well. Because I think that so much of, um, uh, we find the connections are people that you don't really realize maybe you're talking to or you know, the, just the relationship network and sort of how that ecosystem develops. So um, one of our advisors, a guy named Walter Robb, he's the former CEO of Whole Foods. He joined Whole Foods when there were two stores and then uh, grew it with John Mackey and was co-CEO of the company when they sold it to, to um, uh, Amazon. And we work closely with Walter, and Walter's been a great mentor to us and working with our entrepreneurs. The Illinois connection is that Walter is spent, actually, a, quite a bit of time here at Illinois because his grandfather was an All-American football and an All-American basketball player back in the 1920s, I think, or 1918. He's actually hanging, his uh, jersey is hanging on the, um, in, in State Farm Center as well as um, in this stadium. And, you know, Walter, I found when I'm with him, you know, he doesn't go around and talk about who he is, but I've seen people be really rude to him as well as people, people being very nice, not even knowing who he is. And, you know, he clearly wants to, like, work with people who are nice and helpful. And if you're an entrepreneur that meets him and you're incredible, he will, like, go out of his way to be like, what do you need? Who can I introduce you to? And Walter's Rolodex is incredible. And for us, I think, in recruiting and trying to get top talent, so much of it sometimes is just access to the right person at the right time um, that you need and getting a little nudge from them to you know, take a risk on this company, I think can make a difference. So that would be my other advice, just like always you know, be thinking about, not necessarily what can this person help me with, but um, you know, who you're meeting, just being kind, um, as you were saying, or uh, friendly um, can go a long way. Okay, are we, any more, any last questions? Do we have time for any more? Anybody else? I think we've exhausted everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.